an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. John Donne caught it years ago and placed it in graphic terms. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And then he goes on toward the end to say, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Intense and merciless. But I oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. I speak out against it not in anger but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart and above all with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America. There can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. Those who say to me, stick to civil rights, I have another answer. That is that I've fought too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodations to end up segregating my moral concerns. I'm not going to do that. The others can do what they want to do. That's their business. Other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration. That's their business. But I must say that I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. My expertise, as you know, is CIA, Marine Corps, three CIA secret wars. I had a position in the National Security Council in 1975 as the chief of the Angola uh, task force running the secret war in Angola. It was the third CIA secret war I was part of. The national security uh, law creating the National Security Council and the CIA, as you know, was passed in 1947. The CIA was given this charter to perform such other duties and function as might be ne necessary to the national security interests, and given a vague authority to protect its sor sources and methods. And I think it was in the mid-80s that I coined this phrase, the thir Third World War, because in my research I realized that we were not attacking the Soviet Union and the CIA's activities. We were attacking people in the Third World. And I'm going to just quickly, in the interest of time, just give you a little sense of what that uh, what that means, this Third World War. Uh, basically, it's the third, I believe, in terms of loss of life and human destruction, the third bloodiest war in all of history. They undertake to run operations in every corner of the globe. Uh, they also undertook the license of operating uh, just totally above and beyond U.S. laws. They had a license, if you will, to kill, but also they, they took that to a license to smuggle drugs a license to do all kinds of things to other people in other societies in violation of international law, our law, and every principle of nations working together for a healthier and more peaceful uh, world. Meanwhile, again, they battled to convert the U.S. legal system in such a way that it would give them control of our society. Now, we have massive documentation of what they call the secret wars of the CIA. We don't have to guess or speculate. 
We had the church committee investigate them in 1975, gave us our first really in-depth, powerful look inside this structure. Senator Church said in the 14 years before he did his investigation that he found they had run 900 major operations and 3,000 minor operations. And if you extrapolate that over the whole period of the 40-odd years that we've had a CIA, you come up with 3,000 major operations and over 10,000 minor operations, every one of them illegal, every one of them disruptive of the lives and societies of other peoples, and many of them bloody and gory uh, beyond comprehension almost. Uh, extensively, we manipulated and organized the overthrow of functioning constitutional democracies in other countries. We organized secret armies and directed them to fight in just about every continent in the world. We encouraged ethnic minorities to rise up and fight. People like the Mosquito Indians in Nicaragua, the Kurds in the Middle East, the Mongs in, in Southeast Asia. We have organized and we still do and fund death squads in countries around the world, like the Treasury Police in El Salvador, which are responsible for most of the killing of the 50,000 people just in the 80s, and there were 70,000 before that. An orchestration, CI, secret teams, and propaganda led us directly into the Korean War. We were attacking China from the islands, Kemoi, Matsu, Thailand, Tibet, uh, a lot of drug trafficking involved in this, by the way, until eventually we convinced ourselves to fight the Chinese in Korea. And we had the Korean War, and a million people were killed. Same thing for the Vietnam War, and we have extensive documentation of how the CIA was involved at every level, or the national security complex, because it's a very cooperative thing, into manipulating the nation into the Vietnam War. And we wound up creating the Golden Triangle, in which the CIA, Air America airplanes were flying in arms to our allies and flying back out with the heroin. We launched the, the largest, this is something that Jimmy Carter did, Admiral Turner brags about it, the, the operation uh, in Afghanistan, biggest single operation, I'm told, in the history of the CIA's secret wars. And sure enough, very quickly we produced the Golden Crescent, which is still the largest source of heroin perhaps in the world today. Trying to summarize this third world war that the CI, the U.S. National Security Complex with the military all interwoven in it in many different ways has been waging, let me just put it this way, the best heads that I coordinate with studying this thing, we count at least minimum figure six million people who've been killed in this long 40-year war that we've waged against the people of the third world. These are not Soviets. We have not been parachuting teams into the Soviet Union to kill and hurt and maim people. Uh, especially not since 1954 when they developed actually a capability of dropping atomic weapons on the United States. They aren't Britain, British, French, Swedes, Swiss, Belgians. We don't do bloody gory operations uh, in the countries of Europe. These are all people of the third world. They're people of countries like the Congo, Vietnam, Kampuchea, Indonesia, Nicaragua, where conspicuously they nor their governments do not have the capability of doing any physical hurt to the United States. They don't have ICBMs. They don't have armies or navies. They could not hurt us if they wanted to. There has rarely been any evidence that they really wanted to. And that, in fact, is perhaps the whole point. If they had had ICBMs, we probably wouldn't have done the things to them for fear of retaliation. Cheap shots, if you will, killing people of other countries of the world who cannot defend themselves under the guise of secrecy and under the, the rubric of national security. What you saw in the Iran-Contra hearings was the exposure of the beginnings of a national security state which believes it has the right to override the Constitution of the United States in the name of security. I think that um, there was a substantial shadow government trying to run foreign affairs for the United States. 
in any other country it would have been called a coup. Um, and they seem to have gotten away with it. Modern day pirates, these guys, they have escaped essentially the control of national governments, but they're available for use by national governments. Sometimes they move under color of, uh, you know, and defend themselves as advancing U.S. national interests in this. But I, uh, I think that is very secondary with these guys. They're out to make a buck. I did do it. I am not, as I said in my statement, at all ashamed of any of the things that I did. I was given a mission, and I tried to carry it out. The Iran-Contra hearings, convened in May 1987 by a special joint committee of the United States Congress to investigate the sale of U.S. weapons to Iran and the illegal diversion of money to the Contras. Often, the official explanation seemed inadequate and contradictory. Our government has a firm policy not to capitulate to terrorist demands, that no concessions policy remains in force, in spite of the wildly speculative and false stories about arms for hostages and alleged ransom payments. We did not repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. Despite Reagan's denials, investigations soon revealed that arms had been traded for hostages held in the Mideast. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. Only days later, it was further revealed that the arms to Iran had been severely marked up. Some of the profits had been illegally diverted to support the Contras, a guerrilla force organized by the CIA fighting the Nicaraguan government. The Reagan administration had a major scandal on its hands. The use of U.S. government money for supporting the overthrow of the Nicaraguan government was specifically prohibited when Congress enacted the Boland Amendment in 1984. Even though it remained in effect until 1986, Millions of dollars in profits from Iranian arms sales were secretly diverted to the Contras during this period through contacts with middlemen such as Moniker Gobanifar. Did these hearings uncover the full story behind the Contragate scandal? Or was it merely an attempt to keep the real truth hidden from public view? Peter Dale Scott, professor at the University of California at Berkeley, has conducted extensive research on covert action and CIA activities. The results are detailed in his book, The Iran-Contra Connection. I think the real issue was that uh, both uh, the, the administration and the majority of the people in the committees were frightened that the real scandals, the drug scandals, for example, would really threaten the, 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 any future conduct of covert operations on the scale that they had been handled in the past. And so they were trying very deliberately to limit the damage. This was damage control. And so they were pulling their punches on all the major questions and issues of what would really, what really happened in this thing, what the CIA's role was. Anytime they got into anything that was really sensitive about exactly that, exactly what the CIA's role was and exactly what laws were broken and when, they went into secret session. There was a lot of talk during the hearings about covert operations, national security, the necessity of secrecy in conducting foreign policy. But some experts claim that covert action does not work in the interest of the U.S. national security, nor does it create a more stable world. To think of the democratic governments that have been overthrown uh, in the last 30 years by military coups is almost like giving a capsule history of CIA covert operations in the last 30 years. I mean, they're... There was the overthrow of Prime Minister Mossadegh in, the, uh, in Iran in 1953. There was the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954. There was the um, overthrow of the Brazilian government in 1964. There was the overthrow of the Ghana government in 1966. A lot of the governments I've just mentioned got into trouble with the international oil companies because they tried to assert their national prerogatives over their own resources. Time after time, the CIA has come in on behalf of those multinational companies.
You start a huge covert war that you intend is going to be secret. It's not secret from the Russians. It's certainly not secret from the Laotians who are getting shot at, or the Angolans, or the Nicaraguans, or whoever it is. It's covert from the American taxpayer and voter. And uh, a lot of people make a lot of money off of it. Um, and it attracts criminals. And it has every single time. Who are the names, the faces, behind these covert activities? Some, like Oliver North, General Secord, Albert Hakim, are practically household names. But whether there is actually an organized secret team or simply a loose association of individuals, it is clear that there are a number of people who have been working actively behind the scenes in these covert operations. Some of the names are Theodore Shackley, who was Assistant Deputy Director of Operations for the Central Intelligence Agency as of 1976, under George Bush, who was CIA Director at the time. Thomas Kleins, who worked as a case officer under Shackley in Miami and in Laos. General John Singlaub, who worked with Shackley and Kleins in Vietnam and was in charge of the CIA's special operations over the border into Laos. General Richard Secord, who supervised the air operations into Laos and was later assigned to the Pentagon, where he was put in charge of arms sales to Iran. Albert Hakim, who was a salesman for U.S. weapons companies and a middleman in the Iran-Contra affair. These are the men who have been stirring the, the pot around the world to instigate these wars uh, on the, the side of the right wing. And that's the group that we're dealing with right here, who are making war around the world for their own personal profit. Cuban revolutionary troops such as these have invaded Castro's leftist island fortress, reportedly rallied by a mysterious coded radio message. Alert, alert. From the sea and it was after the failed invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs in 1961 that Theodore Shackley, as CIA station chief in Miami and his assistant Thomas Kleins began working with Rafael Quintero and other right-wing Cubans to overthrow the Castro government. In 1965, Shackley and Kleins were transferred to Laos where Shackley became CIA station chief, Kleins his assistant once again. It was here in Southeast Asia that they teamed up with General Secord and Singlau. And they there began running the secret war in Laos and Cambodia and Thailand. Uh, everybody in the United States basically thought the war was going on in Vietnam. In fact, there was a major dirty war, covert war, that was fought primarily through assassinations uh, of people that were suspected sympathizers of the path at Lao or other people who were not terribly sympathetic to the Western powers. When Theodore Shackley was promoted to director of CIA Western Hemisphere Operations, he supervised the plans to overthrow the democratically elected president of Chile, Salvador Allende. Allende, a socialist, had promised to nationalize the copper mines and other industries and posed a threat to U.S. business interests in Chile. After a bloody coup, Allende was replaced by a right-wing military dictator, Augusto Pinochet, whose security forces brutally murdered and tortured thousands of political dissidents. As private businessmen and government operatives, Shackley, Kleins, and Secord, along with Wilson and middleman Albert Hakim, turned their attention to the Mideast. They supplied arms to Mideast governments while skimming off huge profits into hidden bank accounts around the world. They secretly supplied weapons and military intelligence to Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somoza and helped the Shah of Iran eliminate his enemies. There is an early bond between Iran and Nicaragua. The bond is this secret team of men. So throughout that period from October of 1977 to December of 1978, this secret team has two major operations, one to support the Shah, the other to support the right-wing dictator Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua. The, this was their world at that time. The Shah collapses in December of 78, and Anastasio Somoza collapses in July of 1979.
After the overthrow of Somoza, many of his former National Guardsmen fled to Honduras, where they were organized and trained by the CIA as a counter-revolutionary force to fight against the new government in Nicaragua. They began to create the Contras, to try to do the identical thing that was done by the supporters of Batista against the Cuban revolutionary government back in 1959. Not an indigenous force inside Nicaragua that had any support from any of the population in Nicaragua. It was a total artifice that was created by these men. One of the original Contra political leaders was Edgar Chamorro. He joined the Contras in 1981. I became involved with the Contras because the CIA, using people from the White House, they invited me to be one of, of the Contra leaders. Uh, I, I was told that the, this was just a, a war for a year, that the United States wanted to put this pressure on Nicaragua. But then after a year or so, I found out that uh, this was not the case. We were being used to deceive uh, the American people. We were used to, to lie. To Congress. The tactics used by the Contras were tactics of uh, terrorizing civilians, making uh, situations where civilians were uh, getting, getting killed. Nicaragua, under President Reagan, they are in fact giving the Contras written instructions in violence and destabilization. The target is the people. Uh, the, the social and economic infrastructure is what you're hitting at. It's not a bloodbath. It's like you go into a village and you kill a few people to make your point. The purpose is to disseminate terror traumatize the people. We're not killing Sandinistas in the capital. We're not blowing up their homes and terrorizing them. We're hitting at the people throughout the interior of the country. In the early 1980s, when the CIA was working to establish a southern front in Costa Rica in the war against Nicaragua, a relationship was established with John Hull, an American rancher living in Costa Rica. There is mounting evidence that the airstrips on Hull's ranch became not only a delivery point for illegal Contra weapon shipments from the U.S., but were also used for transporting cocaine into the United States. You have CI bases in Costa Rica and Honduras. You have airplanes flying back and forth continuously landing at bases in the United States uh, where they don't have to go through regular customs with the CIA escorting the people in and out in a certain uh, laissez-faire in the attitude at best of the customs if there is you know, any customs representation there. So it's a dream situation for drug smugglers. But CIA involvement in the drug business did not start in Central America. It dates back at least as far as the Vietnam War. Well, the three men, uh, Shackley and Singlaub and Secord, were all working together from different countries on the huge CIA secret war in Laos. Our allies were the opium-growing tribesmen, and this meant that we continued in a very large way not only to support but really to augment a flow of heroin. This had to be run with the knowledge and the approval of the people who were in charge of these air operations. And uh, these air operations had been controlled in the 66-68 period by General Secord. The weapons trade and the narcotics trade in the world are two of the top five major money-making transactions in the whole world. These two major commodities in the world are hundreds of billions of dollars that go on. So the amount of money that we're talking about here is absolutely gargantuan. And all that the intelligence community, these guys have gone outside the, the governmental structures, are tapping into hundreds of millions, which they need to run their operations. 
Do you think the Iran-Contra scandal will have an effect on future government operations? No, I think it would be more the same. I don't think that it's going to have much of an effect at all. I just think that they'll be more careful next time. They will continue to carry on covert operations. I think this has been going on forever. They make laws which are for us that they don't seem to be able to, uh, they don't apply them to themselves very often. And who is going to inhibit them? The gangsters that are running this country is going to inhibit somebody. What's happening here, my friends, is a major deception, a major deception which is in process as we stand and talk tonight. A major deception in the same way that the Warren Commission was a major deception worked upon the American people. The same way that the Watergate investigation was a major deception worked upon the American people. Just like the bombing, the secret bombing of Cambodia was kept secret and was a deception worked upon the American people. How long, how long are we going to stand for being deceived in this manner? Assassination, drug smuggling. If they had pursued that line of questioning, uh, they would have soon gotten themselves into a position where they would have had to impeach someone. They could track that right back into the White House. They could put it at least right, un right under the nose of Ronald Reagan. This is the major constitutional crisis since the Civil War. You have a president who is unaccountable and says that uh, it's his interpretation of what laws he'll select to obey. When you have that, you have a constitutional crisis. Covert operations have never done this country any good. They may be of momentary advantage to the people who are in power at a particular moment, but in terms of the interests of this country as a whole, they have proven disastrous. There isn't a single one in 30 years that you can point to and say, well, that was one that we are now more secure, better off, and happier as a result of. Every one of them has in its own way contributed to the deterioration of security in the world that we live in. And so it's really time to stop them. Instead of operating within rules and law, we have been supplying lethal weapons to terrorist nations, trading arms for hostages, involving the U.S. government in military activities in direct contravention of the law, diverting public funds into private pockets and secret unofficial activities, selling access to the president for thousands of dollars, dispensing cash and foreign money orders out of a White House safe, accepting gifts and falsifying papers to cover it up, altering and shredding national security documents, lying to the Congress. Now, I believe that the American people understand that democracy cannot survive that kind of abuse. There was a time when ignorance made our innocence strong. There was a time when we all In the late afternoon of December 4, 1980, an unmarked grave was found in a field in El Salvador. When it was opened in the presence of the U.S. Ambassador, it revealed the bodies of four women. Mary Knoll's sisters Maura Clark and Edith Ford, Ursuline's sister Dorothy Kazel, and lay missionary Jean Donovan. Of the five officers later found responsible for the rape and murder of these women, three were graduates of the United States Army School of the Americas. The School of the Americas originated in 1946 in Panama. Now it is located on the grounds of Fort Benning, Georgia. The school teaches commando operations, sniper training, how to fire an M16, and psychological warfare. Since no major declared war between Latin American countries has occurred in decades, and the communist threat has vanished, why provide this kind of training? 
Representative Joseph Kennedy. If you look at the course ranges that uh, are offered to uh, these uh, uh, individuals, they in fact are a, a dedicated way of uh, teaching uh, military leaders in foreign nations how to subvert uh, their local communities. Since it opened, over 55,000 military officials from 23 Latin American and Caribbean countries have trained at the school, about 2,000 students a year. As facts have emerged about the school and its graduates, it has drawn the attention of a growing number of human rights activists, such as Mary Knoll father Roy Bourgeois. Just down the road here is this school, the School of the Americas. It's a combat school. Most of the courses come around, revolve around what they call counterinsurgency warfare. Who are the insurgents? We have to ask that question. They are the poor. They are the people in Latin America who call for reform. They are the landless peasants who are hungry. They are health care workers, human rights advocates, labor organizers. They become the insurgents. They are seen as el enemigo, the enemy. And they are those who become the targets of those who learn their lessons at the School of the Americas. What has been learned about the lessons taught at the school? In the 1980s, the Civil War in El Salvador became a focal point for human rights activists throughout the world. Death squads operated freely, often killing 50 people a night. There were so many cases that on March 23, 1980, Archbishop Oscar Romero in San Salvador made a plea to the military leaders of his country. I would like to make an appeal in a special way to the men of the army. In the name of God, in the name of the suffering people whose laments rise to the heaven each day more tumultuous, I beg you, I ask you, I order you, in the name of God, stop the repression. While celebrating Mass the next day, Archbishop Romero was assassinated. A number of years later, the National Security Archives in Washington, D.C. made an important discovery when they obtained a copy of a declassified cable. Kate Doyle. These two cables are both from the American Embassy in El Salvador. One is from Dean Hinton, who was then ambassador to El Salvador in 1981. And it discusses a meeting during which Roberto Dobuisson plans the murder of Archbishop Romero. During the meeting, there is described a lottery that the people who are attending the meeting hold to see who would draw the right to kill Romero himself. Dobison was trained at the School of the Americas. Also trained at the school were two of the three officers directly responsible for the assassination. December 11th, 1981. El Mazote, a small village in El Salvador. First, they forced everyone out of their houses and made us all lie face down in the street, both men and women. There were soldiers on both sides. Then they moved away to see the women kneeling down on the ground to pray. They killed all of them. Not a single one of them survived. Just me, by the grace of God. I hid under a tree. When I heard the screams of the children, and I knew which ones were mine, they were crying. Mommy, they're killing us. Over 900 men, women, and children were massacred. Virtually the entire population of the village and the area surrounding El Mozote. Out of 143 bodies identified in the laboratory, 131 were of children under the age of 12, including three infants under the age of three months. 
Ten of the 12 officers cited as responsible for the El Mazote massacre were graduates of the School of the Americas. They were members of the Atlacatl Battalion, a part of the El Salvador Army. November 16, 1989, San Salvador. Six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper, and her 15-year-old daughter were slaughtered. To get the facts about this incident, a U.S. congressional investigation began, led by Representative Joseph Mokley. I went down, talked with the embassy, talked with the military, talked with the unionists. The killing was done by the Atlicatel Battalion, which is the crack battalion in, in that country. And these are the people, some of them had just returned from the United States where they were taught a course on human rights, amongst other things. 19 of the 26 officers implicated in the Jesuit murders were graduates of the school. The United Nations Truth Commission report, released on March 15, 1993, cited specific officers for committing atrocities during the El Salvador Civil War. At School of the Americas Watch, just outside Fort Benning, Georgia, Vicki Immerman matched the names cited in the UN report with names in a United States government document. What I did was I took these officers, all the officers listed in the report, and I took their names and looked them up in this list of graduates of the School of the Americas, which we received through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, what I found were 49 of the 60-some 60, 60 officers listed. Uh, were graduates of the School of the Americas. El Salvador is only part of the school's story. In the entry area of one of its main buildings are photographs of those the school honors, its so-called Hall of Fame. At the top of the list, Hugo Bonzer, former dictator of Bolivia, a graduate of the school. Some of the others similarly honored are the former dictators of Honduras, Ecuador, and Argentina. And generals from eight other Latin and Caribbean nations, many cited by human rights groups for involvement in human rights abuses in their own countries. Among other graduates, Manuel Noriega, former president of Panama, currently in prison in the United States. Four of the five ranking Honduran officers who organized death squads in the 1980s as part of Battalion 316 are graduates. Half of the 250 Colombian officers cited for human rights abuses attended the school. The three highest ranking Peruvian officers convicted in February 1994 of murdering nine university students and a professor were all graduates. During the dictatorship of the Somoza family, over 4,000 National Guard troops graduated from the school. Many of them later became known as the Contras, responsible for the deaths of thousands of Nicaraguan peasants in the 1980s. The general in charge of Argentina's so-called dirty war was a school graduate. During that internal conflict in the late 1970s and early 1980s, an estimated 30,000 people were tortured, disappeared, and murdered. General Hector Gramajo of Guatemala was the featured speaker at the school's graduation ceremonies in 1991. Human rights groups claim he is the architect of strategies that legalized military atrocities in Guatemala, resulting in the death of over 200,000 men, women, and children. As a Catholic priest, as a, as a U.S. citizen, I really feel a responsibility to speak out against that because of this. This does not lead to healing. It leads to death and suffering. In a way, this is a, a death machine. And this, I want to say, is very close to home because it's in our backyard. It's not out there in El Salvador. This is not in South Africa. We're talking about a school of assassins right here in our backyard being supported and financed through our tax money. It's being done in our name. An amendment offered On September 30th, 1993, the School of the Americas was debated by Congress for the first time in its history. 
It happened when an amendment to the Defense Department budget was introduced by Congressman Joseph Kennedy. Mr. Speaker, my amendment would reduce the Army uh, operation and maintenance account by $2.9 million, the amount dedicated to running the Army School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. The intent of this amendment is to close the school. We're only uh, 30 or 40 votes short of, of winning. Uh, that means that uh, if people around the country hear about this and write their congressman, we can win. This is an issue that we can win on. And what's very important right now, I feel, is to let our voices be heard. Bishop Romero said it best before he was killed, before he was assassinated by, by someone who trained at the School of the Americas. He said, we who have a voice, we have to speak for the voiceless. And I'm re I realize that we here in this country, we have a voice. We can speak without having to worry about uh, being disappeared or tortured or being picked up. We can speak. And I just hope that we can speak clearly and boldly on this issue. I'm not very educated. But in my simple words, I think that the only thing the School of the Americas has accomplished is the destruction of our countries in Latin America. Don't give us any more of that military aid. It would be better to help the poor who are in need. We need the voices of others, and we also need those letters to congressional leaders to let them know that we will not allow them to use our money to run a school of assassins. Till now, the diagnosis is not settled for this uh, child. Mm -hmm. He complained from prolonged fever and this wasting. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. We worth it, it because she believes the sanctions are working. In November 1997, former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark headed a delegation of the International Action Center on his seventh trip to Iraq to investigate the continued effects of the United Nations sanctions on the population. We were shocked by what we saw, an almost total absence of medicines, medical supplies, and spare parts for the equipment. Despite the heroic efforts of medical personnel, babies, children, and the chronically ill continued to die in vast numbers. The United States government claims that Saddam Hussein is to blame for the crisis. What is the real cause of the suffering? The sanctions. They are an extension of the 1991 United States war against Iraq. The goal was to cripple Iraq's infrastructure and make civilian life unsustainable. We demonstrated the capacity of technology to cripple a country without ever setting foot on it in the Persian Gulf. It's important to recognize that because it goes hand in hand with the sanctions. When we merely say that we flew 110,000 aerial sorties in 42 days, one every 30 seconds on the average, 24 hours a day, we ignore what we really did. Officials said the death toll was now 288, with many more to come. 
The trucks kept filling up and driving away past waiting relatives who knew they might never be able to identify the bodies of their loved ones. The community of Amaria filled one of the first of many funerals with gunfire in sign of grief and fury and with angry words aimed through foreign journalists. My mother, she's gone, shouted this young man. This woman asked, could not all your modern technology tell you that there were children and women here? Bill Blakemore, ABC News, in the Amaria district of Baghdad. We destroyed every silo for grain or anything else storing food in the whole country. We destroyed all the storage and processing of food plants throughout the country. Even dates, the world's biggest exporter of dates famous processing and packaging plants in Baghdad, deliberately destroyed. We didn't want them to be able to feed themselves for a long, long time. We're all aware of the famous little powdered milk plant. The, the United States government says that in this factory here you are making chemical weapons. Is that true? No, that's not true. They are lie because this is milk for children. Uh -huh. It's powder, milk of children. Uh -huh. Nothing else was made, only this in the factory? Yes, and you can see in yourself. With the only factory in the Middle East to produce powdered milk, they were producing about 17% of their powdered milk requirements. We destroyed that, cut off all the milk, and malnutrition of the mothers immediately jeopardized all of the infants. 70% of the pregnant women, even today in Iraq, suffer anemia. The death rate for children has soared compared to 1989, the last year before sanctions. One of the biggest causes of death in Iraqi children today is diarrhea and dysentery due to the untreated drinking water. Iraq's water purification plants were heavily bombed in the war, and many that were repaired have broken down. The United Nations bans the import of spare parts and chlorine into Iraq to purify water. We saw the effects of this policy in the hospitals. This is the second attack form of acute bloody diarrhea, anemic dysentery. Most of them are due to contamination of water. Is malnourished, anemic, underweight with a developmental delay. Diarrhea and vomiting. Do you have tap water there? No. You can see the conditions of these children shouldn't shouldn't happen anywhere, and it's caused by the sanctions that the United States government insists upon. The U.S. military used 800 tons of depleted uranium weapons in the war, causing a rise in cancers among the population. Why does the United States government spend $50 billion a year to patrol the Persian Gulf and keep Iraq locked down? Please raise their hand. Why does it pressure the Security Council to maintain the total blockade? We need to look back on the recent history of Iraq. For many years, U.S., British, and French oil companies owned 95% of Iraq's oil while they maintained a puppet monarchy in power. The people lived lives of extreme poverty. When the Iraqi people carried out a revolution in 1958 against King Faisal II, U.S. and Britain lost their stranglehold. They sent thousands of troops to the Middle East, but it was too late. Iraq had become a sovereign country. Iraq nationalized its oil and used the wealth to develop industry, modern sanitation, education, an excellent health care system, electricity, and highways. Iraqi women won new rights. The United States wants to return Iraq to its earlier status as a virtual colony in order to secure its control over the Gulf region's oil, which is two-thirds of the world's petroleum reserves. 
our involvement in the Gulf is not transitory. It predated Saddam Hussein's aggression and will survive it. Long after all our troops call, come home, there will be a lasting role for the United States in assisting the nations of the Persian Gulf. There are those that would like to lift the sanctions. I am not among them. Our main objective, our main objective is lifting the sanctions, which has been very, very cruel on our people. Why do you think Americans want to keep the sanctions? That's their policy. Why do you think? Let's ask them. That's their policy. It's against the will of the international community. It's against the will of many other countries. I think they are making profits from that. But I don't want to make accusations. Financial profits? Yes. Like how? Who is selling oil instead of Iraq? Iraq had a... Uh, uh, a share in the oil market that share was topped by the sanctions who's selling that who they know very well that Saudi Arabia jumped from five million barrels a day to eight million barrels a day three yeah, million yeah. barrels the Iraq's share have been added to the share of Saudi so, Arabia and we would take this to a war front to protect Saudi Arabia is making more money no, you are sharing that money. Everybody knows that. Before the sanctions, Iraq used its $20 billion in annual oil exports to import 70% of the country's food and medicine. The cutting off of Iraq's oil by the Security Council has caused widespread hunger. Starvation of civilians as a method of warfare is prohibited by international law. The sanctions are a violation of the Geneva Convention, the United Nations Charter, the Constitution of the World Health Organization, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of the States. It's not France, it's not Russia, it's the United States which is imposing these sanctions which are killing their children uh, by the hundreds of thousands. And we believe that the right policy for the United States government is to stop the sanctions and that the people of this country who are paying, having our tax dollars used to impose hunger and starvation are not really being spoken for in this current crisis. But the crisis. UN has back, backed these sanctions. Well, the United Nations for the last six or seven years has become virtually a plaything for U.S. policy, and that's because of U.S. dominance uh, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. That doesn't mean that the people of the Middle East or the people of the world really support U.S. policy. Today's march that we're beginning now is a procession to commemorate the more than half a million children in Iraq who have died from the sanctions policy, a policy that's so linked. The growing hunger here in the U.S. is reflected a thousand times in the starvation of more than a million people who died in Iraq. I think it's very important that each one of you came out here today and to keep in touch with us and to raise your voice, to show your face, to stand and walk with the Iraqi people. We are thousands of miles away from them. But when I was in Iraq, I felt so desperately. I wanted to call the United States, and I wanted to say, sisters and brothers, organize a demonstration now. Get together, even if it's 25 people, even if it's 10 of us. Show that we are here in the United States that they have friends here who do not believe in the extermination of the Iraqi people, that they have friends here who say... The International Action Center has launched a major medical aid campaign to deliver medical supplies to the people of Iraq. Essential medicines and supplies can save the lives of many, many people. We are asking everyone who sees this video to join in making the Medicine for Iraq campaign a success.